in doing this story and interviewing people, every day that I do this or do the research, it's very disturbing. So how do you maintain yourself mm -hmm. dealing um, in your line of work? I smile when you ask that question because that's actually something in the last 10 years that um, I've put a lot of thought in, but also, too, a lot of work in. You're right, to do this kind of work and not take care of yourself, you're not going to be really fulfilling what you want to do with helping someone because you're so caught up. You're not able to take some time, take some distance, allow yourself to let all of what you've been Secondarily, that vicarious uh, trauma affects you. You can't just say, oh, well, I can just keep on seeing client after client after client and never process this heavy stuff that comes out when we're in session. So for me, and I think I got this early on, early, early on. You know, therapy is about the gift to gab. And I, and I don't mean that in a light way, but talk is important in therapy and also too nonverbal. But I realized I needed to have something to balance off. So I started drifting towards Eastern philosophy, Eastern techniques of calming yourself. So I'm a big fan of meditation. I'm a big fan of doing, not just sitting meditation, but walking meditation. I'm a big fan of affirming my, I believe that we all have a divine right to be happy. I'm real fortunate. I work with really wonderful people who do tremendous work in holding this stuff with people and helping people get to breakthroughs in that process of healing. So the whole idea of physician heal thyself or healer heal thyself, I take it very seriously. Um, it's interesting as you just asked this. I just came from a five-day meditation retreat in silence. Most people will say, well, why didn't you go to Cancun or Jamaica? Um, those are fine. But for me, I was able to recharge. I was able to sit with myself, and that's really hard. And if I'm asking my clients to do that, I need to be able to say that I can do that. I have an acupuncturist, okay? I have a therapist. I'm learning how to play a banjo. So I'm doing these kinds of things to also just balance off all the things that I do with people. So thank you for asking that. I love acupuncture. Mm -hmm. I love that. No, it is. Uh, I need to do that more often. Um, so um, I'm trying to get a, a visual of your work. So do you do one-on-one -on -one sessions with clients mm -hmm. and then group? And what, what entails um, either one that you would like to share or can sure, share with us? Sure. I do both. I do individual psychotherapy and group psychotherapy. So, a lot of our, our clients are coming from the harm as a result of childhood sexual abuse or rape as an adult. And really, that's where the individual work kind of allows a person to really identify the pain and suffering, to process it, and to get to a place where, you know, I can, I can move forward now. I, I, I might not be able to ever forget this, and most people don't, because these are these kind of traumatic events that mark our lives forever. But can I function? Can, can, can this healing help me go forward? So that individual work, I'd say probably at some point we, we are able to identify, hey, this individual work is done, but there, there's some other issues in the tissues, I, I like to call it. There's other issues that are still sort of boiling underneath there, in, in, in a soft boil, because in an individual you're able to really t turn that turn that control panel in your mind and, and, your, and your emotions so that they don't become so intrusive, then you realize, hey, I'm, I'm doing so much better. 
maybe a group would also help kind of finish this off. And in a group setting, especially around sexual abuse and sexual assault, um, especially childhood sexual assault, you're in a group with other men who are also sharing their story. And I think what parallels both individual and group is three things. Cognitively, what we think, how we think about what has happened to us. Exposure, exposing the story. And behavior, how this has affected my behavior, how can I change my behavior? Because maybe, maybe that self-medication I was doing with, with drugs and alcohol really helped me out in the short term, but in the long term it became a debilitating addiction. So I can look at maybe I don't need to use alcohol and I can re start reducing it to the point that I don't use it anymore or whatever drug they, or, and even food too. So there's a lot of symptoms that come along with, with people that come to us and people that I work with. And I think the general diagnosis is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and the symptoms that, that, that especially the men that I work with and, and, and in groups, they talk about the hypervigilance, the paranoia, the depression, the acting out sexual behaviors, the acting out in really dangerous kinds of things. Um, People will get involved in martial arts or self-defense techniques, but, but find an excitement in that. So it's like that adrenaline rush, and, which can be really dangerous if you're always looking for that constant rush. So that's kind of like what we do in terms of the context of, of how we treat people. But also too, you know, there's crisis intervention. Um, Sometimes it's just, I need to just know that I can connect with somebody. Uh, I, I, you know, I think one of the things also too that's important in this kind of work, therapy is one thing, but there's also too the case management issues. Some people don't have housing that's appropriate. They're living in situations that are really negative really toxic. They, they need to be around people who are clean and sober. Not just with drugs and alcohol, but clean and sober with emotional life, character, personality. If you're always around people that are always yelling and screaming, if you're always, if you're always around something where the volume is on high, how can you begin to bring that calmness in your own system? And you don't know how. And it's hard to kind of get those opportunities when you're in that kind of environment. Um, that makes me think, I'll ask this uh, a quick one and then um, get back to the child abuse um, issue. Um, that makes me think of like jail. So I was um, looking at some videos that the state of New York uh, had issued about and I'm going to show a clip of these in the in the film mm -hmm. and it was it was men male inmates and they were talking about how t t it was like a video that they would show new inmates it was like that and how to protect yourself uh, against sexual um, assault and that the state is doing more you know considering a, a ser more serious issue than they ever had before yes. blah, blah 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 but when you're talking about people who are in environments where the volume's always on 10, mm -hmm. which is like jail, mm -hmm. and then all of the things, even if, it, like, even if someone is not assaulted sexually in mm -hmm. prison, I would imagine just the fear of being in there, of the fear of everything. So what kind of shape are these people in when they come home? And are these some, some of the people who may come your way as clients? Absolutely, um, and I'm so glad you brought that up. That, that video, um, I, I really appreciate the state for taking that leap. Several years ago, I started um, a relationship with an inmate in the New York State prison system based on a call from a rape crisis program that had been contacted because this person had been sexually assaulted in prison 
and just really needed to talk to somebody. They didn't know what to do. So they reached out to us. They reached out to me. I started having phone sessions. From those phone sessions over a period of a couple of years, I started getting other inmates that heard, hey, you can talk to somebody about this. Because in prison, that volume is always on. Always on. The degradation of, of, of your human beingness is greatly challenged by the system and by the other inmates that are there. So that being said, we really pushed the state. And luckily, the, it's almost like the stars were aligned because this whole thing comes out of the Prison Rape Elimination Act of 2003. Prior to that, there, jails and prisons didn't even admit that rape was going on. So with this act, all monies that these facilities and institutions receive had to comply with setting up some kind of response system, setting up some kind of services that would be available for men who reported being raped or sexually assaulted, either by prison guards and inmates or by uh, um, contracted um, pe people who are contracted to do, to do services, whether it's teachers, whether it's occupational therapists, or what have you. And we started meeting with the Department of Corrections, and we started talking about having something in an orientation that would speak to this. And this video came out, and it was a really awesomely done video because it included inmates and was real authentic and it was straightforward. We also, with that, developed a hotline system. So inmates can call anytime. We get the call, we process, figure out, okay, who can take this person on, and start instituting week, weekly or bi-weekly telephone sessions. And the prison system has been really, really accommodating in that. That being said, a lot needs, a lot more needs to be done. A lot more needs to be done. That video is also supposed to be given to the correction officers. And that's a big thing. So, be, having, having to be in prison and having to deal with being either harassed sexually, I mean, even, <coughs> excuse me, even when they're doing a body check, <coughs> guards will violently touch and, and squeeze a men's genital. But you can't really report that because if it's not a sexual intent, the system will ignore it. Well, of course it's a sexual intent, but no, this is what we have to do to check for weapons, to check for contraband. But sometimes it's done in a very harassing, retaliatory way. So I think we've really done a lot in this state to start addressing um, sexual abuse, sexual harassment, and sexual assault within the prisons and jails. We've got a lot, lot more work to do. And I think with this um, hotline, which has been in existence about two and a half years. Oh my goodness, it's just been overwhelming, the calls that we get, and we're feeling really good about connecting with other programs throughout the state that are also participating in this. And they're, they're, they're in fact, the New York State Coalition on Sexual Assault, NISCASA, based in Albany, they've actually hired a person who's going to be kind of like the prime mover in organizing programs and services that can be provided, but also being a watchdog within the Department of Corrections. Do you find uh, any of your, uh, the people that you work with, your clients, as the men, will they, even if it's privately to you, do you find that they will name the person who who they say assaulted them? Uh, and I mean, even as children, like, will they say it was my such and such, or do they want to um, keep the person's name or identity quiet? It could be a little bit of both in terms of how... Remember how, to put the... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
identifying a perpetrator is a is a challenging thing. A lot of times when that perpetrator is a family member, children are often put in this situation of having to protect the family, even though it's a family member doing this abuse. And oftentimes the perpetrator will make sure that that victim knows if you tell anybody, I'll get you or I'll get this person in your family, or I'll hurt this person. So fear, shame, all of these things keep a person almost like, I, I don't even want to acknowledge the fact that I was abused, much less the person who's doing it to me. And that person be, could be sitting across from me at the dinner table or sitting watching TV in the family TV room area for years. I do find though, that when a person gets to that place, I have to talk about this. I can't hold this by myself anymore. If they don't sit down in first session and go right at it, within a couple of sessions, the identity is revealed. What I'm finding is, a lot of clients will ask, I know this person, you know this person, what can I do? I have to allow a person to really talk about what would it mean for revenge for them. Most people don't want to harm anybody, after, even after they've been abused for years, and some of the most horrible things. They don't want to per you know, perpetuate the cycle of violence and the cycle of abuse. In fact, most, most men They realized that that hurt that came to them, they would never want a child, never want a young person to have to deal with that. They become very afraid of, of being around younger people, of being around children, only because there's this thing in the uh, uh, abuse community, it's uh, called the, the vampire effect. In other words, if you've been sexually assaulted or abused, you're gonna, re the bite you're going to now want to seek out others and bite them, sexually abuse them. Uh, it's really far from the truth. Again, most just don't want to ever repeat that abuse, but they want to name. Naming and claiming is such an important part of shedding the abuse, of not wearing the abuse, of being in control because so much power and control has been taken from so we also grow up, I know I did, you don't tell anything, you don't let anybody know our family business. Sexual abuse is not family business. Oh, well, sexual abuse should be exposed. And the names. But when you're a child and you're supposed to have adults taking care of you, you can't, you can't risk that because that's all you have. What are the options? Well, you'll be taken from your family. You'll be put in another family. You do, you do not know. You'll be taken out of your school, foster care. You don't know what kind of family you're gonna be getting into. Will, will it be a family with other children in it? And, and, and you need to have a lot more individual attention. Children know. They, they, they are very familiar oftentimes with how the system treats them. So they're pretty much, look, I, I have to hold this myself because I know no other way. So perpetrators, identifying them is really, really important. And when a person is able to get there, it's, it's, it's a major breakthrough. Um, is it unusual for someone who was abused as a child uh, or a, ch a, a child who's currently being abused, um, and I mean, and when, and I mean, like preteen coming up into teen years, to kind of uh, not play the role with their abuser, but kind of like everything's hunky dory. Like, does the child really think everything's fine? Because um, 
you know, we're not, all of this is alleged, of course, so this is not for you to name anything specifically, but one of, one of these people who I'm interviewing really had this close bond with this guy, even though he was his abuser as a child, and, like, it, it, part of this whole naming and claiming thing has been very hurtful because they actually miss this person, too. So can you talk about like the complexity of the like emotional complexity of of what may come along with cuz some people have separated themselves from this abuser and so they don't have any emotional attachment and this is what happened to them and it, but others have came up together for years. So I'm not sure what that question is but it's complex it seems. Yeah. Um, there is, I think all young men, all boys, crave identification and acceptance with older men and older boys. It's part of how we grow up. It's part of a rites of passage. Being able to have somebody be attentive to you, to kind of say, you're kind of cool, young blood. Come on, man, hang with me. Whoa, this guy really like likes me and he does music or you know, he's always wearing really nice clothes and he drives a nice car. All the girls, all the women seem to be around him and he's looking at me, he's checking me out. Makes me feel good. Perpetrators know that. They know that this is a person that I can probably do whatever I want to. I can shape his mind. I can mold him. I, I think about how young men are shaped with a friend of mine who does pottery on a wheel. A lump of clay is thrown on and you shape you do all of that fine work. That's what perpetrators do. They build and mold and shape. They tell you all these wonderful things. They give you a little money. They'll, they'll give you other material kinds of things, uh, especially in the music industry. You know, the tchotchkes that are given, whether it's a hat or it's a shirt, or you know, a bag to carry, or just being able to be around the crew. A person, a young man, it's like I'm in seventh heaven. So then all of a sudden the unwanted touch, well you want to be touched, you want to, you know, in, in a way that men touch each other. But then these unwanted touches, it, it, it goes beyond just that handshake that we tend to, you know, really groove on, you know, men will always shake. It's amazing how we, we will hug each other and grab each other and, you know, um, shake each other. But then that goes, to, all of a sudden, your hand is in my pants. Oh, well, I guess it's okay, because I'm, he's got me hanging out here, and he gave me the key to the studio and told me to clean it up. And the next thing you know, um, pornography is being shown. Next thing you know, he's masturbating in front of me and, and joining me to come along with him. So bit by bit by bit, before that young man can, or that boy, has a, not even the, the, the capabilities to understand what is going on except for this. He likes me. He cares about me. He wants me around. So yeah, that's what kind of is the hook. And by the time, by the time most young men really understand that, most boys understand that, they, they get tossed away. There's a, there was a special on a couple of years ago, Thursday Night Boys, and it was a, a documentary about um, young boys that are shaped and molded, actually dressed up as, as girls to dance in front of these uh, warlords in Afghanistan. And, and they are sexually abused. And I kept thinking about all of the situations that I've heard about 
right here in New York City, whether it's been at a YMCA, uh, whether it's been at an after-school program, whether it's been, and this has been highly publicized, the Boys, uh, um, the boys Choir of Harlem. All of these situations. These men were grooming these boys. And no one, no one thought second that anything was going on because, hey, he's cool. He's our leader. And often pillars of society in one Absolutely. way or another. Um, what do you think, is there a difference? Um, we use, uh, this is terminology. Mm -hmm. So if there is a young boy um, riding his bike and he gets snatched and assaulted, um, that would be like violence against a child. So is, mm -hmm. uh, is sexual violence also what you're describing? Mm -hmm. Is that, what is sexual violence against a child? I think it's pretty cut and dry. Oh, oh, oh. Mm -hmm. Sexual violence against a child comes from maybe two places, uh, uh, especially in the work that I do. The legal, um, rape, pedophilia, sexual assault, all come with these legal conscripts to it. And then there's the emotional clinical aspect of it. They kind of parallel each other, but oftentimes the legal is never part of it because it's not reported. So you're left with this person and hopefully they can get therapeutic help. But oftentimes if you're not, if you feel that this is just something I had to deal with, amongst all the other kinds of things that I have to deal with, it becomes like, well, it's my past.